to be discussed. One is the management of patients who display symptoms, and the other one is management of patients that are well, that need anticoagulation, or who are already on anticoagulation. Let me start with the first scenario, management of patients who display symptoms, and the question there is, should OAC treatment be continued or not? We know that the patients with COVID symptoms are at increased stronger embolic risk. So the question is, should we continue? Or should we switch, for instance, to low molecular weight heparin? We are not sure about that. We don't know what the right answer is, but there's one point that might be important. If the patient is on antiviral agents, that might lead to a DOAC interaction and increase the plasma level. So in this situation, it might be beneficial to switch to low molecular weight heparin. The other point is that patients that are uh, that have uh, COVID have an increased bleeding risk. So in this situation, if the patient is not on an antiviral agent, it might play a role whether you have an antidote or not for special bleeding situations. And I will come back on this topic later on in my talk. So the second point, and there are some recommendations from the Australian authorities and the British authorities, and also from the ESC, the management of patients that are well. And they recommend if you initiate oral anticoagulation, maybe you should choose the DOAC because one important point in this COVID situation is that you should minimize the monitoring burden. And this patient, on warfarin, you have a high monitoring burden, and this is not good for the staff and not good for the patient. And you should even take into account those patients that are on warfarin that you might consider to switch those patients to DOAC again to minimize the monitoring burden for the staff and for the patient. Just to remind you, if you switch, you should have the rules in mind. And this is a little bit different between the different drugs with Sabigatran and Apixaban. You stop VKA, and as soon as INR is below 2, you start with Sabigatran or with Apixaban. With the Doxaban, it's different. I don't know why, but there the threshold of INR is 2.5. And with Rivaroxaban, it's even 3.0. So this, these are the rules. And if you switch a patient, you should obey to those rules. So this was just a short comment on the COVID situation and anticoagulation. So now let's, let's go to a patient. Uh, this was one of my patients. She's 77 years old. Uh, she had a stroke with aphasia and moderate right-sided hemiparesis. She did well after two weeks. She has risk factors like badly controlled hypertension. She has some comorbidity like reflux disease. Uh, her weight is 75 kilos. Uh, creatinine was 1.0, and if you calculate the creatinine clearance, it was 56 milliliter per minute. So this lady now is afraid of having a secondary event, and she asked me, uh, am I at risk, and how high is my risk, and what can I do to prevent the second event? And we can calculate it quite easily. Uh, you take the, the CHATMA score, so the patient had a stroke, two points, she's uh, older, elderly than 75 years, she has hypertension and she's female gender, so she has six points. And this is a very high score for a lady like this. So her one year rate of thromboembolism is around 20%. So this really is high and the patient is really anxious. And what we know is the second event after a stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation in most cases is a stroke, not a myocardial infarction or anything. So what we really have to prevent is a second stroke. And you all know how to do this, and this is uh, well be done with anticoagulation, and we know the old AF data that were published in Lancet, so we bring down, in average, the risk of recurrent stroke from 12% per year to 4%. This really is a huge risk reduction, it's as high it's operating on a high-grade symptomatic carotid stenosis. So I think we, we all treat 100% of our patients with stroke and high-grade 
carotid stenosis. We all operate on those patients, but still in patients that have suffered a stroke, that have atrial fibrillation, we do not put all these patients on anticoagulation, even though the effect is comparable. So, of course, the other side of the medal in this patient is the fear of bleeding. We can also calculate it. Uh, she has a not very well controlled hypertension. She had a stroke and she is elderly. That means older than 65 years. So she gets three points, and this means a 3.7% major bleeding risk per year. So you have to balance it. You really have to, to talk to the patient with these numbers, and that's what I always do. I tell the patient your risk of recurrent stroke or embolism is about 20% per year. Your bleeding risk is about 4%. What do you think will the patient choose? I think doctors do not want bleeding, but patients do not want to have a second stroke. And this was published uh, a few years ago in thrombosis and hemostasis. If you ask the patient, he's really afraid of having a stroke more than suffering from bleed. So the patients are willing to accept on average 4.4 major bleeds to, to, to prevent one stroke. So for patients, a severe stroke is viewed as equal or worse than death. So we should keep that in mind if you talk to the patient. So let's go back. What is your choice now? Now you have the choice between warfarin and four NOACs in different dosages. And the question is, which one do you choose? Which one do you recommend for the patient? So let's start with warfarin. Warfarin is excellent and all the old studies like the ER studies were done with warfarin. The problem with warfarin, and please keep that in mind, at least 70% of your INR values have to be within the range between two and three. If it's the TTR, we, we, you know, we, we, we call it TTR, the time and therapeutic range. If it's below 70%, it's like giving no warfarin. So you really have to be very, very well in what you are doing. At least 70% of your values have to be within the range. And if you go to the RELY studies and, and there were only expert centers involved, you see that the majority of centers did never reach the 70% uh, uh, time therapeutic range. So it's very hard uh, to, get, to, to do this uh, in, a, in an excellent manner. So this is the first point. The second point is, and this uh, chart is, is, is not shown very often, it was published in thrombosis uh, thrombolysis. And these are the warfarin arms of the NOAC studies. And what you can see here in the upper part, the better your TTRs are, the better is efficacy of warfarin. I mean, this is not surprising. So if you are good with your TTRs, Warfarin is effective. As I showed you, more than 70% have to be within the range. But if you're an excellent anticoagulation doctor and you have TTRs of 80% or above, this does not prevent bleeding. So a good TTR management, a good INR management has no influence on bleeding, only on efficacy. So the bleeding point, the bleeding risk is a risk of warfarin, not of anticoagulation uh, procedure. So when we take this into account and we know that most bleedings in the brain occur when INR are normal or subnormal, and this is one of my patients here, uh, the patient was under anticoagulated. As you can see here, the INR values are like 2, 1.6, 1.7, and when the patients came in with this bleeding, the INR was only 1.8. And if you look upon this in a systematic manner, we know that about 75% of ICH events occur in patients that are therapeutic or subtherapeutic with their INR value. So again, bleeding, major bleeding or bleeding in the brain is not dependent on how you're good, how you how good you are. Anticoagulate your patient. It's a problem of warfarin. I don't use warfarin any longer. I do it in, in special occasions if the patient wants it or if there's a contraindication about, uh, against NOAC. 
So actually, you have the choice between the four NOAAs in different dosages. Do you really have the choice with, with the different dosages? I, I'll come back on this. No, with the 10A inhibitors, you do not have a choice. There's only one dose, and this is in a Pixar 1.5 milligram, in a Doxa 160 milligram, and in a new Riva Roxa 120 milligram. Only if you have certain conditions like high age, low weight, high creatinine or creatinine clearance. You are obliged to reduce the dose. You have no choice. Only under certain circumstances, you should take the reduced dose. And if you go back to the studies, the phase three studies, you can see that this was done in five to 25% of patients in those studies. So in special patients, you can reduce the dose, but there is no choice between low dose and high dose. So in my patients, there is no reason to give a reduced dose. You have only the choice between the full dose of the 10A inhibitor. As I showed you in the trial, the reduction rate was between 5 and 25%. What we see in real life is that up to 50% of the patients get the reduced dose. And in most of these patients, there is no indication for that. We had a German study from the insurance company uh, with rivaroxaban and apixaban. The rate of reduced dosing is about 60%. And most of the patients, as you can see here, half of the patients do have normal renal function. So this really is not good, but I see it very often in clinical practice as well. What happens in real world, and this was published with Rivaroxaban and Apixaban, if you look for the reduced dose arms in, the, in, in real life, you can see that those patients that are on reduced dose, Rivaroxaban and Apixaban, and most of them are not adequately reduced, they have a higher mortality, higher death rate, than patients on warfarin. So you should really be aware of, of giving reduced dose that is not adequate. So let's come back. You have no choice as far as dosage is concerned with a fixer one, with the doctor one, with the doctor one. What is different with the bigger one? Here you have the choice because the difference is that in the real life study, this was the only study where there was no dose reduction there were two dosage arms. So the patients were randomized either to Dabigatran 150 or they were randomized to Dabigatran 110 against warfarin. And the outcome, as you know, was excellent for both dosages. Like, let's start with the 150, the blue one here. There was superiority as far as the primary endpoint is concerned, stroke or systemic embolism. Vascular mortality was uh, better with uh, WK150. Major bleeding was not increased. It was similar as warfarin, even though the primary endpoint was better. And intracranial hemorrhage was reduced significantly. Only the major GI bleed was higher with 150 milligrams of the bigger. If you go for the bigger 110, the bigger one, 110 was as good as warfarin. And warfarin really is an excellent drug as far as efficacy is concerned. Vascular mortality was comparable. Major bleeding was significantly reduced. And ICH also was significantly reduced. And there was no problem as far as gastrointestinal bleeding is concerned. So these are the results of the two arms, the two Dabigatran arms, 150 and 110 milligrams. So now we have a label, and the label says if the patient is below 75, give 150 milligrams. If the patient is, like my patient here, between 75 and 80 years, you can consider you have the choice between 150 and 110 milligrams. And if the patient is above 80, you can or you should take the patient on the bigger front 110. So this is the label. As I told you, in the RELY study, the patients were randomized. So what, what you can do is you can simulate, you can reanalyze the RELY data and put the patient in the label dose. 
not in the randomized dose, put the patient on the label dose and then reanalyze the results to show that this EU labeling is reasonable. So that's what they did in thrombosis hemostasis. And as you can see here, if you would have treated the patient from the real life with the label dose instead of randomizing the patient, you can see that there are only advantages as far as the bigger trend is concerned. It's major bleeding, it's ICH, it's life-threatening major bleeding, it's any bleed, and it's also efficacy as far as stroke and vascular mortality is concerned. So the EU labeling makes sense, and that's why we use it. And I'm very happy as a neurologist to have the choice and discuss this choice with the patient. There's one second point that might be interesting because I told you the patient I'm talking about has a retinal clearance of 56. So it's somewhat impaired kidney function and you might be afraid that the bigger trial in this patient is not a good choice because there is a lot of discussion about renal impairment and the bigger trial. But if you go into the data and the meta-analysis of the NOAC studies, and you take the subgroup of patients with impaired renal function, that means between 30 and 49, you see that in these patients, the bigger than 150 was the most effective drug of all known. Now, you might be afraid that these patients have a high efficacy, but a higher bleeding rate than often. But this is not the case, even though the bigger than 150 was more effective and warfarin in these renal impairment patients, it was it had no higher bleeding rate, as you can see here. Pixar one was not superior as far as efficacy is concerned, but here the major bleeding rate in those patients was reduced. So if you go for maximal efficacy in patients with impaired renal function, the bigger than 150 might still be a good choice. So let's go back to my patient. She's 75 years old, so I have the choice. She had a good recovery. She has this badly controlled hypertension. She has the reflux disease. And I discussed it with the patient and we ended up with the bigger than 110 milligram. Uh, and this is a good choice. And the second point, and now I come to my experience with the reversal agent. If I discuss this situation, this decision with the patient, they always ask, because they have read in the newspapers, they always ask, do you have an antidote? And with warfarin, you know, I have to say no. And with the bigger tran, I can say yes. And I will go through some data and some personal experience with the reversal agent with you. So again, what you have to discuss with the patient, if you do anticoagulation, you have two goals. One is to prevent brain infarction, and the other one is to prevent bleeding with anticoagulation. So here again, here's the data synopsis of all NOAC trials. And you can see that there was superiority with the bigger trend and apixaban, and intracranial bleeding was reduced in all NOAC, but there are some uh, results are similar, some are superior with the NOAC. And uh, I think NOAC and secondary stroke prevention always is a good choice. These were the study data. How does it look in, in real life? And here again, it's very good to know and very reassuring to know that in all real world data, the bigger fun, as far as major bleeding is concerned, was superior to warfarin. But still, risk reduction does not mean risk elimination. What we know from the study, and this is true for all NOAA, there still is a residual risk of major bleeding complications. And you can see it here. It's like 2 to 4% per year. And we know that, and this is true for all NOAC, that this risk goes up in a linear fashion. So what is 4% today is like 20% in five years. And I hope that you and me treat the patient not only for one year, we treat them for many years. So the patient has some reasonable risk to suffer from, uh, from one kind of hemorrhage. So it's not hypothetical that there might be a bleeding with oral anticoagulation. It's there and we need to have a plan how to treat patients in a situation like this. So let me start 
uh, with a patient of mine. This was the first patient that was treated with idea system up in Europe after the label. And this was a patient who was on the Bigatran and he had taken the drug about six hours ago. And he came to our emergency room. And if you see him bleeding like this in an elderly patient, so this, this patient has a bad prognosis. Uh, the uh, thrombin time was high. It was like 120 seconds. So you know the patient has taken the drug. He was something like almost 80 years old. So what can you do with a patient like this? Of course, you cannot make the bleeding go away. It's an oral anticoagulation associated hemorrhage. The problem for the patient is the growth of the bleeding. The hematoma growth is critical for the patient and has a very strong influence on outcome. So what you should prevent is the growth of the bleeding. And you can see here one hour really makes a difference. So the bleeding is growing fast. Noaks have a lower bleeding rate in the brain, but if you have a bleeding in the brain, mortality is as high as in a warfarin associated intracranial hemorrhage. So there is no protective effect. If you get your OAC associated bleeding in the brain, it doesn't make a difference whether you are on warfarin or whether you are on a oral anticoagulation is a NOAC uh, drug. Mortality always is as high as between 30 and 50% depending on risk factors and age of the patient. So what can you do? And we know it from the elderly trials with warfarin, you have to normalize blood pressure and you have to normalize coagulation very rapidly. And if you do so, if you normalize the coagulation system, then you have a better prognosis for the patient. So what you can do in a patient on a NOAC, you can of course normalize the blood pressure and you can also normalize the coagulation situation. And this can be done with idiocytimab. Idiocytimab is a specific reversal agent for dabigatran. It's an antibody fragment. It has a high, very high affinity. You give it via IV administration. It has an immediate onset of action, as I will show you. It has an, a half-life that is short but long enough. And what is very important in some situations, as I will show you later, there is no intrinsic procoagulant or anticoagulant activity. This is important. Keep that in mind. So. There was this reverse study. I think most of you know the results of the reverse study. And what's, what was specific in this reverse study was there were two groups. Group A was in life-threatening bleeding. And group B, and the reverse study and idelcizumab is the only drug that had group A and group B. So bleeding and emergency procedure. The endpoint was normalization of the thrombin time within four hours. And then, of course, there were some secondary clinical outcomes. And the result was that in group A, the patient with a life-threatening bleeding with idiocytimab, the thrombin time was normalized immediately. So you give two vials, and after the first vial, there is complete normalization of the TT values. And if you look for bleeding cessation, uh, it, it, it depends on what kind of bleeding you had, but if you had some visible bleeding, uh, the cessation was achieved uh, after two and a half hours. So these were very good results, but we are interested not in any major bleeding, we are interested in the intracranial bleeding. And there were about 98 intracranial bleedings that occurred while the patient was on the bigger front. And here in these 98 patients, the mortality, of course, this is a disadvantage of this kind of studies. There was no control group. It was considered to be unethical to have a placebo controlled trial. If you have a patient with an anticoagulation drug and he has bleeding in the brain and you know you have a specific reversal agent, you cannot go to the patient and ask him uh, for consent for randomization. 
But this still is an, a disadvantage, but you cannot solve that problem. But what we saw is that mortality in those patients was very low, it was only 16.4%. If you go to the historical data from the Rely study, and if you look on the patients that had ICH and were on warfarin or on the bigger trans without reversal agents, mortality was as high as we know it, between 30 and 40%. So this is reassuring data, and this was good to know when I treated my first patient, and I come back to that patient, so idiocystimab was given immediately, and the result was there was no growth of the bleeding, and the patient went to rehabilitation board after two weeks in quite a good condition. So this was the first patient I treated, and here's the case series. This was uh, the first case series uh, that was published in Germany. It's 40 patients, and as you can see here, the patients came in with an NIH stroke scale of seven, and they left the hospital with a median NIH stroke scale of three. There was hematoma expansion only in three patients, and mortality was low. 15%, so this matches well with uh, the data from the reverse ID study. So I think it's very nice to have this reversal agent in cases with dabigatran associated hemorrhages in the brain. So this is one point, but the second point is even if you have an optimal anticoagulation, ischemic stroke might occur. As I said, Risk reduction does not mean risk elimination. And if you go into the studies, you can see in the RELY, in the RESTOTAL, in the ROCKET, in the ENGAGE trial, there is a residual stroke risk in these atrial fibrillation patients of 2%. And here again, this increases in a linear manner. So what is 2% this year is 20% in 10 years. And these are patients, those with atrial fibrillation and embolic stroke that, that suffer from severe stroke. So what you really want is you want to treat those patients with thrombolysis. So uh, let's go back. And this was a patient only a few weeks ago. The patient was 88 years of age. The patient was on the bigger plan, and she woke up in the morning. She walked to the toilet and she wanted to stand up from the toilet, but she could not. So there was an alarm, uh, EMS came to the spot, the patient was admitted to our hospital, the NIH stroke scale was five with a severe left hemiparesis. Thrombin time was 93 seconds, so we knew the patient was on the bigger front, she had, she had taken the drug, and this is a dilemma. So we did MRI scanning when the patient arrived in our hospital. What you can see here, there was some DWI lesion already, but it was not visible on flare. And the question is, now you are the doctor in the emergency room, what do you do? The patient did not have a proximal vessel occlusion, so mechanical thrombectomy was no alternative. You can say, I never use recanalization therapy if the coagulation tests are not normal, and this was true in the patient, as I showed you, thrombin time was uh, long, like 100 seconds. You might reverse the oral anticoagulation effect with a specific reversal agent and then use RTPA, or you might say, I don't know. So what did we do? We looked for the data from the reverse trial. As I told you, there was also a group B and this was urgent procedure or urgent intervention. And from the lysis of a stroke patient is an urgent intervention. And in these patients, again, it was shown that idiocytomab can normalize thrombin time within minutes. And if you ask the surgeon, and most of the cases were surgical case, cases, if you ask the, the surgeon, how did you feel hemostasis, was it a normal hemostasis or was it hemostasis of a patient that is on oral anticoagulation? 93% of the surgeons said this was a normal situation. It was like in a patient without oral anticoagulation. 
So you now you can normalize coagulation values with idiosifima. So the question is, is it allowed to do so? Is it according to the label to treat a patient who is on the bigger trance and suffer from ischemic stroke? Is it allowed to normalize the coagulation situation with idiosifimab and treat the patient with alteplacent then? Let's go to the uh, uh, label. Yeah, if a patient is on the bigger trance and you have normal coagulation assay, you are allowed to treat this patient with thrombolysis. Idiosifimab has the indication for urgent procedures, by the way, andexanet alpha, which is a reversal agent for the 10A inhibitors, does not have the indication for urgent procedures. It only has the indication for bleeding. So in this situation with 10A inhibitors, you are not allowed to antagonize uh, the uh, NOAC. And you are allowed to give alpha phase if coagulation tests show no clinically relevant activity. So if you take all this information together, if you have a patient that suffers ischemic stroke on the bigger trans, you are allowed to normalize the coagulation situation with ideal system of first and then treat the patient with alpha phase. So as I showed you, we did the MRI scanning and then the patient was treated with idiosisimab, and 10 minutes later, we administered RCPA in this patient. And what was the outcome of the patient? You can see the patient after two weeks walking on my ward, and she went to rehabilitation and had a very good outcome. Again, it's an 88-year-old woman with a severe stroke, with severe heavy paralysis, with other NOAC or with Warfarin, you could have, you would have no choice. The patient would have been lost. So in this situation, we were very happy to give this combination therapy. And it's also in the guidelines. If you look for the ERA guidelines, if there is a direct antidote available, and for the bigger fund it is available, you might consider thrombolysis in selected patients after reversal, and that's what we did. And these are the first results that we recently published in the International Stroke Journal this year. And these were 80 patients, and these 80 patients came in with an NIS stroke scale of nine. And we treated all these patients with IDA system at first and then with RTPA. And the discharge NIS stroke scale was two, and the same is true for Rankin scale with four at the beginning and two when the patient left the hospital. So there were no bleeding complications reported. There was no thrombotic event related to IOSISIMAP. Only 3.7% of the patient died. So this, I think, is an excellent series of patients. And I, I ask, like, how often is IOSISIMAP used in Germany? And the last number I got was, like, three times a day. So it's, it's really it's used. It's used in Germany. And most of the cases where it is used is in this situation with thrombolysis and uh, the bigger trans. As I told you, in Germany, it's three times a day that it is used. In New Zealand, there was a recent study that was published in Urology a few weeks ago. In New, Ze in New Zealand, 6% of all patients that are thrombolyzed are patients that were treated with ideal system up first and then with RTPA. This does not mean that with the bigger tran, you have so many ischemic strokes. You know that the bigger tran 150 has the lowest rate of ischemic stroke from all NOACs, and it was even better than Borfarin as far as uh, ischemic stroke prevention is concerned. But this is the only situation where you can thrombolize a patient that is on a NOAC, and this is a patient with a bigger tran because you have a specific reversal agent. So I think it's it's very good and very important to have this specific antidote, the idiosisimab. You can give it for emergency interventions, as I showed you. You can give it in life-threatening or uncontrolled bleeding. It's easy to use. Just give a short infusion, two vials. It's widely available in, in many, many hospitals, like in, in Germany, it's in all hospitals available. And 
I, I told you half life is short enough, but long enough. So you, it, it, uh, you can start with the bigger trial because the patient needs anticoagulation like 24 hours after application of this idea system. You all know that there is an antidote available also for the 10A inhibitors, but it's with andexanet, it's, it's a little bit problematic. First of all, as I told you, you can only use it in life threatening bleeding. Then there is a problem. There might be transient procoagulant signals. There are still studies going on, but the most important point is it's so expensive that even in a, in a, somewhat rich country like Germany, we cannot afford to buy it. So in, like in my hospital, it's not available. Uh, either system up has a reasonable price like PCC. So uh, that's why we have it in, in all hospitals in two or three spots, like in the emergency room, we have it on the stroke unit and we have it uh, in the operating room. So these are really important differences. And did you ever use a dextanet alpha? If you did, it's very, very hard to use it because you need many, many vials uh, until you reach uh, the, the concentration you need for the patient. And then it's a continuous infusion that you need. So it is theoretically available, but I don't have it. And uh, I don't know any hospital in my surrounding that really has the index on the alpha. So let me sum up and I hope I could give you some uh, information that you didn't know before. Uh, we know that from the randomized control trial that the NOACs are the drugs of choice in patients in secondary stroke prevention. What we should keep in mind, if we use them, we should use them at full dose. There is a trend of underdosing, inadequate underdosing, and I showed you that then the patient is left at risk of death. Only, as I showed you with the bigger trial, you have a choice between low dose and high dose, and you can discuss it with the patient. I am very happy that we have a specific reversal agent with IDAU system up. And uh, as I showed you, if the patient is on no therapy and suffers from ischemic stroke, as I showed you, 2% per year, you have a choice to treat this patient with intravenous thrombolysis if the patient is on the bigger trial in the other NOACs or with warfarin, you don't have this opportunity. So this was my summary. It was, it was nice speaking to you. I hope it was nice for you listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Jones, uh, for uh, uh, establishing and emphasizing on Belgium's use of NOACs and the advantages of NOACs over warfarin in this patient population. Uh, so you also emphasize its advantages even the long term as well as uh, immediate uh, short term. Uh, thank you for that. And we have a, a handful of questions. Uh, let's take uh, one by one. So first question is from Dr. Jairaj Pandian here. Uh, the question is, patient with uh, a trip fibrillation on NOVAX develops COVID. How to monitor the OVAC activity? They also need to be given low molecular weight heparin. How to decide? Pursue uh, low molecular weight heparin. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's what I said. In a, in a COVID situation, we should not give a combination. We should really go to low molecular weight heparin in those patients. Uh, because then you really get into trouble. If you have a you know, like, like with heparinoids and 10A inhibitor, and then you have the, the bigger tran or another NOAX, you shouldn't do that. So treat the patient with low molecular weight heparin or with unfractionated heparin. I mean, this also is an option. We, we have forgotten about this option uh, nowadays. Uh, so I, w I would go to, for a single therapy. Oh, thank you. And unfra unfra un unfractionated heparin, you can just stop, and then after two hours, uh, uh, the activity is gone. Uh, uh, thank thanks, Dr. Grant. Uh, uh, let me read out the next question here. Um, this is regarding switching uh, between NOVAX. Uh, there are a couple of questions related to that. On what occasions do we switch between the Novax uh, from one to another? It includes rivaroxaban to uh, uh, dabigatran. And there's one other question which asks about uh, uh, where would you would choose apixaban and dabigatran. To be honest, uh, I take a choice only between apixaban and dabigatran. Because, you know, we, we have from the, from the 
from the studies. We know that only a Pixaban and a Bigatran were superior to warfarin. A Doxaban and Rivaroxaban were similar. So if I have a choice, why not take the best? And the Pixaban and the Bigatron are the best. And so uh, for me, you can take the, the one or the other. The advantage of the Bigatron, and that's why I discuss it with the patient, is the reversal agent. In my country, this really plays a role because the patients are informed, they know about it, and they have always asked for reversal agent when we did not have one. Now where we have it, it's really vividly discussed. So from the efficacy and safety point of view, a Pixaban at the bigger front is a good choice. Well, Rivaroxaban is out in my country nowadays because the real life data showed that there might be an increased bleeding risk. And this once daily dosing may be too low. So uh, I told you, you, you have the choice between the two and switching from one NOAC to the other. I do not do it very often. I mean, if the patient suffers a stroke on Rivaroxaban and Edoxaban, of course, I, I put the patient on a Pixaban uh, or on the bigger one because they are superior, as I told you. So sometimes I switch them because I like those two drugs most. But there's no reason, uh, for scientific reason to do so. Um, the next question is from here is from Dr. Sudhir Kumar. Uh, starts with the case scenario. A 75-year-old male non-valvular AF on dabigatran 150 milligram DID developed an ICH, reversed with idaricizumab. How soon can we restart a dabigatran? This is a very good question. Uh, so the guidelines leave you a little bit alone. They 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 say like after 10 days or so. For me, I wait. This is my personal decision. I wait two to four weeks. I feel a little safer, as I sh showed you with the bigger plan, because I have the reversal agent in, in, in case there might be a second bleeding. So what I do is, and this is very practical, this is a no guideline. What I do is after bleeding that is not, you know, devastating, I start with the bigger plan 110, always at 110, because I know this is a fully tested dose. For the next two weeks, and if the patient needs 150 because he's young or whatever, then I switch from 110 to 150. So start low and slow, and then go on the on the on the, on a high dose if the patient needs it. But this is my personal advice. And in patients that have already suffered brain hemorrhage, I really like to put those patients on the Nabigatran because of the reversal agent. They have a higher risk of bleeding. So I really need a widely available reversal agent. Uh, thank you, doctor. The next question here is, a patient on dabigatran develops a large vessel occlusion ischemic stroke, uh, direct mechanical thrombectomy, or use praxvine followed by a mechanical thrombectomy? The question is from Dr. Pantia. Yeah, it's, it, it depends on, 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 the, on the timeline. If the patient comes to a hospital where thrombectomy is not available, then I do this either system up and thrombolysis and then send the patient to a thrombectomy center. If the patient comes to a thrombectomy center, like to my center, I will go directly to the thrombectomy unit. So it, you, know, you, have, you also have the choice, like transferring a patient can take an hour or so, depending on your local circumstances. So you have both options. If the patient comes to a center, do thrombectomy right away without, you know, uh, either system up and, and thrombolysis, but if you have a transfer situation, then do the bridging. Uh, the next question here is from Dr. Preeti. Uh, the question here is uh, a case of stroke with uh, acute myocardial infarction. How would you approach anticoagulation, NOVAX or VKA? Yeah, um, again, uh, you know that like in the RELY study, there was co-medication of the Bigatron and aspirin in a, a few patients, but still there was uh, quite good data available. You can combine anticoagulation with aspirin. And you should do. And there it's very nice to have the low dose of the Bigatron, which is fully tested, and you add aspirin, and that would be my favorite choice. In the other drugs, again, you have no option of getting a low dose. 
So this is a typical situation where I prefer uh, the bigger trans. 110 plus 100 milligram of aspirin, and that's a good choice. Uh, for a year, Professor, you know, after, after, one, after one year, the, the, if they have a stable coronary artery disease, after one year, you can stop aspirin, and that, then you can give whatever you want. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor, there are a couple of questions rega regarding uh, COVID-19. Uh, any experience of using dabigatran in COVID-19 induced thrombotic stroke, multiple cerebral infarcts due to arterial thrombosis? Uh, we are seeing such cases in Hyderabad, India. Uh, this one, Dr. Sudhir Kumar. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I, I haven't seen cases like this. So uh, on this topic, I'm really not an expert. We are at the COVID center in, in, in the middle of Germany where I work, but we didn't have any severe cases like this. So uh, I think you're, you're more experienced uh, like me, so I cannot give a, a good answer to that. You should advise me. <laughs> you were lucky in, in, in our country. Uh, Professor, there is one more question related to COVID positive patients uh, having lacunar infarcts. Um, is there a role of uh, uh, oral anticoagulants? I mean, it's it's really hard to say. What I know from the data, of course, if you have a, an infectious situation, there are always more strokes. There are more uh, embolic strokes. There are more uh, thrombotic strokes because of uh, the, uh, the 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 sit infectious situation. So for me, you should treat those patients as any other patient who suffers from a lacuna stroke, and this is antithrombotic treatment. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but there's no real good data in the literature. We all know that even with, with any other infection, there is an increase in stroke manifestation. So whether this really is uh, due to specific COVID infection, I'm not sure about that. Treat them as always. Uh, uh, Professor, uh, there's a question from Dr. Nizam. Uh, the role of Novax in valvular heart disease. Our patients no role they are it doesn't work they they need something else I, nobody knows exactly why but uh, they need warfarin so you can't get out of that dilemma it's a pity we, you know there was a study that tested the bigger trend in valvular disease and it didn't work so uh, this is only for atrial fibrillation we have some data uh, on uh, sinus vein thrombosis now this might also be a good choice because for neurologists we see it quite often and there was a little case series I, I was in the edu adjudication committee and I, I saw that it, a good safety result and it was published so this is the only other indication I see from a neurology point of view. Uh, uh, Professor, there is a question here. Uh, is there a uh, chance of change in hemocrit values uh, in patients, anemic patients taking dabigatran? No. I don't think so. Uh, um, the, uh, there is another question from Dr. Sudhir Kumar. Uh, starts like this, unrelated to today's uh, talk, uh, if you could answer. Uh, any experience of using uh, dabigatran in cerebral venous sinus thrombosis? Yeah, uh, uh, we, we do it. We do it because the data is available. The data was published. I think it was in Lancet Neurology. And uh, what we do if the patient has uh, sinus vein thrombosis, we, we administer that we get from 150 twice daily for, you know, mo most of them half a year. And yeah, it, it, it works well. So, the, the, you know, this was not a superiority trial. It was just a, a, a small trial with 100 patients, but it showed that there was no risk for the patient and there was no recurrent sinus vein thrombosis in those patients. So this might be a good choice. I'm not sure whether this is on label or off label uh, because you know you you have an indication for venous thrombosis and uh, whether sinus vein thrombosis is venous thrombosis or not. You can you can you know uh, struggle about it, but but I, I we do it yeah because data is there and it's, and there's no by the way there's no good data available for warfarin. We use it uh, and now it's very good to to see that you know uh, no arc. Uh, a bigger fun might be a choice.
Uh, Professor, could you uh, once again reiterate when do we restart uh, a NOAC after the patient is uh, having a stroke and uh, appropriately managed? Do you mean uh, ischemic stroke, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, there is. You, you know, maybe this Dino role. Dino is a, a German colleague of mine, and you know, he he's, he says that you know, if you have a TIA or mild stroke, it's like after three to five days. If you have a more severe stroke in the second week, and if you have a devastating stroke, you might ask yourself whether anticoagulation is an option. So we normally start in the first week, but this is three, six, nine. Uh, rule after three days, after six days, after nine days, depending on the on the size of the infarction. And please keep in mind, I mean, when we were in the era of warfarin, you start warfarin today, but it works after four or five days. If you give the bigger tran, it works after two hours. So don't be as fast as you were with warfarin, but I think the first week is no problem. Oh. Thank you, Professor. We, we have uh, answered all the queries. Uh, meanwhile, uh, a question from my end. Uh, you have emphasized uh, saying that there has been a use of greater use of reversal agent uh, uh, in your uh, setting. So uh, from a neurologist perspective, how important uh, is a, a reversal agent uh, in the management of anticoagulation care in patients with non valvular AF? I, I think it's like an airbag in a car. It's, it's important to have it. You, you use it only once in a while, but then you're very happy to have it. And uh, for me, it's very reassuring to have it. And this is why most neurologists in Germany, uh, they prescribe the bigger problem because they know the problems. They see the strokes. They see the hemorrhages. The cardiologists, they don't care because they don't see the consequences of what they are doing. So in, in, in my country, in neurologists, it's, it's really... Not because you are from Beringa. In, in, in my country, the biggest one is number one in neurology. Thank you, Doctor. One last question before we close for the day. Uh, what is the effectiveness of uh, uh, Novax, uh, including Dabigatran, in pre patients with previous stroke or prior stroke or TIA? Yeah, uh, there was subgroup analysis in all NOAC uh, patients with secondary stroke prevention. You know, there was between 20 and 50 percent in the different studies that had already suffered a stroke. And here again, it was like the main results of the study superiority for a fixer when a Tabigatron. And uh, in the full cohort, Tabigatron 150 was the only one that was superior as far as ischemic stroke prevention is concerned. So in secondary stroke prevention, it's the same as in the whole result, the whole study result. Uh, uh, thank you, Doctor. We have uh, 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 discussed uh, all the questions that are pertaining to uh, non valvular AF and from a neurology perspective. Uh, it was great uh, uh, having this uh, discussion and webinar with you. And uh, we also hope that our attendees value the sessions uh, as much as we do. Uh, thank you once thank again. You. Uh, Thank yes. you very much for the, for, for the people that listened to me. It was a pleasure to talk to you, even though I didn't see you. Uh, sure, Doctor. We would also extend our sincere thanks to our attendees for joining us and uh, keeping uh, posting questions and uh, having an interactive session. And we look forward to uh, have such scientific discussions in the near future as well. Thanks once again, and uh, we would like to close it for the day. Bye-bye.